Today we're in Romans chapter 13, and, you know, growing up, maybe you heard this. Never talk about, in public, religion and politics. Well, Romans chapter 13 is all about religion and politics. So we're going to talk about it. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, 1969. When we landed on the moon, I was living in a little surf shop in Delaware, far from a Christian, didn't know anything really about the Bible, grew up in the Vietnam era. My older brother and I had this pack, you know, if we get drafted, we're going to Australia, dude. (laughs) We didn't get drafted, but we've been to Australia. And you know, it's, it's interesting times right now. Being a believer and being called to this dual relationship with government and with our Lord and Savior, I just want to show to start off with a little clip from uh, our nation, the background, what's happening now, back then. It kind of deals with social unrest, so just take a look at it. It doesn't have a big message. It's just an image for you. Most of you will recognize when I hold this up and be able to tell me, what what is this? What? Remember when you used to be able to travel and use these things, passports, and go out of the country? Well, this is my passport. It's taken me to a lot of places. I open it up, and it defines the fact that I'm I'm an American citizen. It gives my full name, John Stephen Spencer, the date I was born. And this passport expires in April of 2029. So as long as I have this passport and it's legal to travel, I can go just about anywhere in the world that it'll take me. And I'm a citizen of the United States of America. But I'm also a citizen of heaven. And... You and I have this dual citizenship if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. We're working our way through the book of Romans. And we're stepping today into chapter 13. But just quickly to to review, which gives us a great background, I think. In chapter 12, it starts off by saying, Give yourself to the Lord, all of you, and He'll make you holy and acceptable And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you'll know God's will. So it starts off by saying, this is how you relate to God based on all he's done for you. You give yourself fully to him. And then it talks about how you relate to the church in verses 3 through 8. We're in chapter 12. Everybody has different gifts, some is teaching, some is serving, some is, you know, gifts of helps. And it it says this is how we relate to God, this is how we relate to the church. And then it goes on to say how we relate to one another in and outside of the church. Chapter 12 says things like this, be kind, affectionate to one another, with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Rejoicing, being patient in tribulation, being steadfast. So, so chapter 12 begins talking about, okay, I'm a believer. Commit myself to the Lord based on all he's done for me. It's my reasonable service. Be a part of the body. Use my gifts. Relate to the other people in the church. Don't be an isolated individual. 
And then it talks about to outside of the church, be kind, be affectionate, be a good testimony. And then in chapter 13, where we are today, it deals with how do I relate to authority? How do I relate to the government? How my faith applies to God, the church, to others, and to the government rules, law, those different ordinances that are passed by our leaders. Jesus himself made it very clear that we have a responsibility to human government. He was asked by his opposition, you know this story. He said, is it lawful to pay taxes or tribute, if you will, to Caesar or not? And they came to to trap Jesus with that question. And Jesus, if you know the story, he, he asked for a coin, and he held one up because everybody handled these every day. This is a coin, actually, that was minted in Israel. It's an interesting coin. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Cyrus coin. And on the front, there's a picture of Donald Trump and King Cyrus, who released the Jews when they were in exile in Babylon and let them go back and build their temple. Well, the Jews are believing that perhaps Trump is a modern-day King Cyrus because on the back of this coin, they have a picture of the temple that they believe that Trump is going to be able to somehow create a peace treaty that allow the Jews in our lifetime to build their temple back on the Temple Mount. So Jesus held up a coin, someone gave it to him, and he said, who, who, whose image is on this? The, 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 the passage is in Luke chapter 20, verse 25. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar, as he held up the coin with his image on it, the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now listen, tune in. Jesus, with this one statement, establishes the validity of human government But at the same time, he sets its limits. He says there are certain things you owe the government, but there are certain things also that you render to God. Caesar had his image on certain things and a certain area of control. We call it human government. But God had stamped us, every one of us, with his image on our mind, on our will, on our conscience, on our soul. We all do all kind of bear this divine stamp, if you will, of God, the inner man, the heart. And chapter 13 begins to deal with this whole issue of dual citizenship. And it's a crazy time for us to run into this chapter, I believe, because we're right in the midst of so much going on in our culture that has to do with government and rules and culture. How do you balance and allegiance to heaven and earth at the same time. I mean, Jesus even prayed before his crucifixion. He said, "Uh, Father, I don't wish that you would take them out of the world, but Lord, that, that, that they would be kept from the evil one. Not to run from society and hide behind the walls of the church, But at the same time, not to be swallowed up by the culture and all its craziness. Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Look what it says. He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wait a minute, God, Jesus. I thought you loved us. You're sending us out as sheep among wolves. He goes, yeah, because I love the wolves too. And I want you to minister to them. I want you to speak to them. So God sets us down in this earthly world, in this government, and he says, okay, you're going to have to function in it, being led by me and guided by me. I'm not going to take you out of it. And I've given different authority to the world, but I've also given different directives to you. So in chapter 13, listen, I'm just going to read seven quick verses. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Let me me just stop there. Every soul? Everybody? 
Yeah, every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist, well, they're appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Okay, do what is good. You'll have praise from the same. For he is God's servant or minister, the government, to you for good. But if you do evil, well, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, in this context, it would have been capital punishment. He does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's servant and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but also because of conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay Taxes, those stinking taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Now the time, and please listen up, that Paul wrote this. And the time of Jesus when he lived was a million miles different from the government that you and I sit under today. The government and power of that time was Rome. And they ruled with an iron foot and an iron boot, however you want to look at it. And they were ruled by one monarch usually who was called Caesar. In fact, he had power in the time of Jesus, this Caesar did, to take a census of the entire world. It was called hegemony. That was a, the title, like complete, complete world control. So everyone had to go to the own city from which they were born and be taxed and be counted. That's the story of Jesus and the story of Joseph and Mary making their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Everyone had to go into his own city. The Caesar at one time was even considered divine, a god. And you would have to give him honor, you would have to give him respect, you would have to give him worship, and you would have to swear allegiance, you would have to say, Caesar is Lord. And he was worshipped. This was the government, this was the time of Paul, and, and this was the time of Jesus, and, and Israel was conquered by Rome and had governors that were ruling over those areas of Judea and Jerusalem under the power of Caesar, like Pontius Pilate during the time of Jesus, in Acts, Felix, and Festus. And Rome would allow, because it, it wanted to keep some semblance of peace, it would allow people who were conquered, like the Jews, to have their own customs, their own languages, certain forms of, of government. Israel had their own king. Even though he was a puppet king, Rome allowed Israel to have a king. You know the story when Jesus was born and the, the Magi came from the east and they saw the star and they went to King Herod and said, hey, we've seen the star of the king who was born. Where can we find him? And he called in all his wise people and they talked about, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they went to Bethlehem and then King Herod, what did he do? Because he had a certain amount of power under Caesar, he had all the children, two years and younger, slaughtered in Bethlehem. And Rome allowed them to have certain control and certain power. Now, Rome also, if you know anything about the nation and its makeup, probably over half the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Their conquered people many times became slaves. It was a nation of slaves, and it had an enormous oppressive taxation system to support and supply all of Rome's military needs, its building needs. And, and you get a brief glimpse, if you will, just through these few comments of the government of the times of Jesus and Paul. And so Paul writes, in this context, listen, let every soul... Everybody be subject to the governing authorities, 
For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Let every soul? Yeah. Why? Well, well, because God has a sovereign authority, and he's allowed it, is what he says. Well, what if I don't agree with him? Oh, no, let every soul. Well, well, what if it's too liberal for me? Well, let every soul. Well, what if it's too conservative? Well, let every soul. What if it makes no sense? Well, look down at verse 5. It says it again. You must be subject not only because of the wrath, but also because of conscience sake. Be subject. It's an interesting word. It's, it's a military word, actually, that means you have a leader, and as one of those who's following that military leader, the word actually means that you line up underneath this one who's in charge like a good soldier. Yes, sir. I'm submitted. It, it's, a, it's a voluntary attitude also of cooperation to help carry a burden. Here I am. I'm subject. I'm ready to help. Citizens, Christian and non-Christians, are to help carry out the burden and need of government being obedient and orderly, not disobedient, not rebellious, not troublemakers, not those of anarchy or lawbreakers. Paul wrote this to Christians because they were viewed by Rome as different. They didn't meet in the synagogue. They didn't follow the same tradition and rules of the Jews. They didn't worship Caesar as Lord. And Caesar at this time that Paul is writing is the infamous maniacal Nero who would eventually decapitate the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is saying, you be subject to Nero and all those authorities. Let every soul be subject. Therefore, whoever resists, verse 2, the authority resists the ordinance of God himself. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. This is a radical statement. I would rather skip over chapter 13 and go somewhere else. But here we are. This is the, the calamity we find ourselves in when we teach verse by verse through a book. Paul surrounds this statement of authority with the sovereignty of God. That power and authority, he says, based on this passage, has one source. He says, it's God. It's kind of like when Jesus stood before Pilate in John chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus answered Pilate and he says, don't you know I have power to crucify you, to condemn you? And Jesus said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. He said, Pilate, you, you, don't, you don't have any clout unless God had given you the authority to do this. It's like in the time of Moses when God raised up Pharaoh. I'll just read it to you from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. You know the Pharaoh that had to go through all these plagues. And, and God said of that Pharaoh, he said this, For this purpose I've raised you up, Pharaoh, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And God raises up, God takes down God's sovereign over authority. And it says in verse 3 in our text that if you do good, if you do good, then, then you don't have to be afraid of authority. But if you do wrong, then, then watch out. It's kind of like this. If you're coming down Highway 98 to get to church or maybe going somewhere else, you come out of Gulf Breeze proper, and you're making your way here, and you hit the National Seashore, Live Oaks. And let's say you're going 45. That's the speed limit. How many of you actually knew that was 45 is the speed limit? Let's say you're making your way east. You come over a little hill there in the Naval Live Oaks. There's one of those policemen kind of hidden by the trees. But you're going the speed limit. You see him. And you kind of go, oh. I'm not on my phone, my seatbelt's buckled, I'm doing the speed limit. You're good. But let's say you're doing the same thing at 75 miles an hour. You come over that hill, there he is, hidden in the bushes, and all of a sudden, 
There's a lump in your throat. There's a pit in your stomach. And you're slowing down as inconspicuously as you possibly can. Not that I've ever done that, but you may have done that. You don't want to hit the brakes because he might see your brake light. So you're just kind of, now you're coasting, hoping, well, your eyes are on the rear view mirror, right? You're looking. Is he going to pull out? Is he going to pull out? You suddenly become Pentecostal. Oh, my God. You know, you're praying all any way you can <laughs> that he's not going to pull out because you're living in fear. That The government is, is to maintain law and order as God's servants, but not as God. And sometimes they try to cross over, I think, into that world of God, and they make laws and rules that have to do with marriage, that have to do with the unborn, that have to do with gender, that have to do with all kinds of crazy things. And you think, what, what is it, who does the government think they are? You say, John, what if the government is evil? Well, the government of Jesus was evil. The government of Paul was very evil. They used taxes and military force to do all kinds of evil things. Nero burned Christians at the stake, made candles out of them. Certainly we can voice our criticism, but to be submitted to government doesn't mean we don't think. It doesn't mean we don't respond. We don't just become conformist or blind. And if we're commanded by law to do something contradictory to what we feel God has called us to do, then we must respond like the early disciples did. And there was a healing that went on, and they began to talk about Jesus after he had risen from the dead, and people were coming to Christ. And the Roman rulers told them not to speak in that name anymore. In Acts chapter 4, verse 19, we've got a couple of verses. This is how they respond. It says, uh, I don't think that's Acts chapter 4, verse 19. There it is. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for which we cannot but speak the things which you've seen and heard. So in other words, we're not going to obey the voice of the law. We're going to obey the voice of God. We're going to put it over you. And there's places in life that that happens. The Apostle Paul spent most of his life and all of most of his letters written from prison. Willing to pay the price for that. Someone said this, I, I think it's most likely true, that the gospel has gone forth more powerfully through those who are willing to die for the gospel or at the very least to be imprisoned for it. Certainly, government can be wrong. I think we'd agree with that, right? Government can be wrong. Just as, although the odds are extremely difficult, a pastor could be wrong. <laughs> or you could be wrong. I could be wrong. Certainly, it's possible. The one in authority can be unworthy of honor and can be wrong, but the institution that God has established who is the ultimate power of, well, demands a certain amount of honor since God established it. And this is what Paul is saying. And listen as he digs into this. He says in verse 5, Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, thrown in jail, but also for conscience sake, God giving you a conscience of, you know the difference between right and wrong. For because of this, you also pay taxes for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Rendered therefore, verse 7, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Most of us pay taxes out of fear. I don't want to be arrested for not paying my taxes. I don't want an audit for not paying my taxes. And there's no fear if you do what's right. We all have the right to protest or come against injustice and correct abuse, but not illegally, not according to Paul. We're all required to pay taxes. I don't know about you. I hate taxes. I remember when I was younger and we had three kids, we had enough deductions and we didn't make that much money. 
I never had to pay any taxes because I didn't make enough money to pay taxes, and I got money back. It was awesome. The kids moved out. I made a little more money. And now I have to write a check to the IRS. And sometimes it's a pretty good amount of money. I can remember, and I've repented of this, but I would write it not to the Eternal Revenue Service. I would write to the Infernal Revenue Service. And then as I repented and got better, I wrote it, and this sounded more apropos, to the Eternal Revenue Service. Because they're never going away. And you know what? I found out even no matter what I put on the envelope, they always cashed my check. In chapter 13, verse 7, he, he summarizes this whole thing about government and authority and, and, and two different kingdoms that we live in. Render, therefore, to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, custom, to whom customs, fear, to whom fear, and honor, to who you are, to honor. It kind of summarizes up those first six verses. In other words, he says, give everyone what you owe. Be honest. You owe taxes, pay taxes. You owe revenue, pay revenue. You owe respect, pay respect. You owe honor, show honor. We, we may deplore the, per, the politics of a particular person or office. We may be opposed to their conduct, but we can honor the office. God has established it. The person is a person like you and I. They have faults and weaknesses. The position exists under the sovereignty of God. This is what Paul is saying. Government is divinely appointed. It's to serve the good of the community. It's to help us get along. I mean, I mean, can you imagine if, if, if there were no rules and no laws? Let's just say in the driving world. Can you imagine? Let's say you're driving and there's no rules. I can drive anywhere I want. If I want to go around and pass and there's no one coming at me in the other lane, I'm just going to go for it. Looks clear. Looks good. I know it's the wrong way. I'm going for it. Our, our, I don't care how old I am or how young I am. I feel like I can drive. I'm going to drive. I'm 10, but I can drive. And I'm like this, going down the highway. I mean, suppose. I mean, ju just imagine that, that you can go any speed you want to go. Do whatever you want to do. It'd be total chaos. And so there's rules that have been put in place. There's, there's different things that, that, that we, you know, have there for our safety. And God says, hey, obey them. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter put it this way, and, and he, was, he was kind of a rebel. He's the one that pulled out the sword in the garden, cut off an authority's ear. He said, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. He goes on, I think, in that passage, for this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. With, with the Lord's strength, we kind of walk out our life in these two citizenships as it's described in God's word. That's the only way I can do it. And then to disobey when it goes against God's will or call on my life. When the Nazis were pursuing their racist elimination of the Jews, there was a pastor at that time in that place named Martin Niemöller who continued to preach the word of God and was thrown in prison and sentenced to be executed. And as he's awaiting, the Nazis are going to put him to death. A Christian chaplain 
visits him and he says, what are you doing here? What brings you to prison? And Martin said to him in an angry tone, my question is, why are you not here? Why are you not responding correctly? Give Caesar what is Caesar's and give God what is God's. Give Caesar what is Caesar's and then Jesus will say, but there's another image, there's another stamp and you're required to give God what is his. You know, we have all kinds of feelings about that and it's obvious that it's blowing up in our culture right now. And one of the things that, that seems to be crazy in our culture is many times you have a majority who's being silenced or led around by a minority, no matter what it might be. And I wanted to read to you, this is more just out of feeling, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, politics, it, it, it comes from a a broadcaster of another day, and I just want you to listen. It, it kind of expresses, I think, some of the feelings that I have at time, and maybe you have too, and we'll close with this. This person says, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I'm not going to sue somebody for singing Ho, Ho, Ho in December. I don't agree with Darwin, he says, but, but I didn't go out and hire a lawyer when my high school teacher taught the theory of evolution. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness will not be endangered because someone says a 30-second prayer at a football game or in a kindergarten class. So what's the big deal? It's not like somebody is up there reading the entire book of Acts during a prayer. They're just talking to God. They believe in Him, and they're asking Him to grant safety to the players on the field and the fans going home from the game and little children in the class. Oh, someone would argue, wait a minute, but it's a Christian prayer. Yeah, it's a Christian prayer. It's the United States of America, and every place you find a church, 200 to 1, are Christian churches. It's a Christian nation. It was founded that way. I mean, if I went to a football game in Jerusalem, I would expect to hear a Jewish prayer. If I went to a soccer game in Baghdad, I would expect to hear a Muslim prayer. If I went to a ping pong match in China, I would expect to hear someone pray to Buddha. And I wouldn't be offended. It wouldn't bother me one bit when in Rome. But what about the atheist? What about them? Nobody's asking them to be baptized. We're not passing a collection plate. Just humor us for 30 seconds. If that's asking too much, put your headphones on, go to the bathroom, visit the concession stand, call your lawyer. <laughs> Unfortunately, one or two will make that call. One or two will tell thousands what they cannot do. And this is just a feeling I've got. I don't think a short prayer at a kindergarten or a nativity scene or, or a prayer at a football game is going to shake the world's foundations. Christians are tired of turning the other cheek while our courts strip us of our rights. Our parents and grandparents taught us to pray before eating. They taught us to pray before we go to sleep. Our Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And now a handful of people and their lawyers are telling us to be quiet. God help us. And if that last sentence offends you, he says, just sue me. The silent majority has been silent too long. It's time that we let one or two who scream loud enough to be heard that the vast majority don't care what they want. It's time the majority rules. It's time we tell them, you don't have to pray. You don't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to attend church or honor Him. That's your right. And we'll honor that right. But you no longer are going to take the rights away. We want to fight back. We want to win. God bless us one and all, especially those who denounce him. God bless America despite all her faults. She's still the greatest nation of all. And God bless our servicemen who are fighting to protect our right to pray and worship. And may we step into this crazy time that we're in. And may the silent majority that's heard, may God be put back as the foundation of our families and institutions. 
and let's keep walking out our dual citizenship, rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. That's who we are. That's what we're called to do. And if that last thing I read offends you, well, sue me.